Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the impact of unstable coalitions on the human rights. And my presentation today is based on I feel the planet together with that of our partner community. I'd like to give an outline of my presentation. The first part of my presentation will talk about the work of Plan X, and then I'll try to give a context on coalition. And then after that, I'll speak on the impact of unstable coalition. But I'm sure what I have today is not exhaustive, but I just picked on a few issues that I think I would discuss today. And lastly, I'll touch on some recommendations on ensuring sustainability in the of background, uh, Plan X is a housing based non profit organization that was established in 1985 to make towns and cities workable. And that vision to make towns and cities workable people still stands. Um, it has a special place in the history of community development, civic and trade union voice in policy development processes during the transition to democracy. Um, if you go back to our annual reports that are available on our website, you will see that Planet has been instrumental in assisting community-based organizations and trade unions such as Moon, Nusa, and COSA to other trade unions on issues of housing and just basic living conditions. And that work still continues today. We are still working in disadvantaged communities, and we primarily work in the form of women because the issues of housing and service delivery are so sticky. So our work is centered around civic education, collective community agency, supporting active citizenship, participatory governance, and the basic inclusion of vulnerable communities in local government processes. And we do this by advocating for accountability and transparency of municipalities to their respective community. And then in terms of uh, context. Um, it was mentioned that in August there was a national dialogue on coalition, and from that dialogue, Salga mentioned that there are 82 municipalities that are currently surveyed by coalition, and 32 of those are said to be dysfunctional. So I think there's something to learn from the, the remaining 50, right? Um, it's important to also note that there's nothing wrong with coalition. They are the electoral system of proportional representation is not designed to produce an outright winner. It is the basis for consensus democracy. In that way, every vote counts. But the problem comes when there is coalition politics, which is not to benefit communities. We've seen the devastating consequence for service delivery, particularly in our work, where you see about two million residents in informal settlements in Gauteng that are affected by poor service delivery, which is their constitutional right. So we found that um, one in six people are affected by inadequate service delivery, which is a huge problem, especially in how they um, We've seen in the recent days, the general talking about how billions are bleeding from in uh, municipalities where there's coalition. There's, um, the situation is dire. Financial management is very poor. But for how they, uh, when you go through, especially the city of Johannesburg, when you go through their um, their budgets, you can see that the you know the revenue is is it's good. There's no reason to be in a crisis. So you ask questions like why? Why is there a crisis? Why is there political because? Because it affects service delivery, and you'll see why in my next slide. Sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Um, I hope we can all see my slides now. Um, the first impact that I'd like to touch on is on the on service delivery, the, the impact of unstable coalitions. 
Um, we ask ourselves who actually benefits from, from the crisis and from who are citizens in, in local government. You know, like I said, that when you look at the budget, you can see that they budgets for services, but people are simply not getting that. You know, we did um, a comparison on one of the campaigns that we are part of, which is Afidikela, and it's a national campaign where there's 13 civil society organizations, such as ourselves as well, um, in local government. And we measured that, and we found that in from February 2022, 67.3 um, residents who responded to our questions had access to water, distance toilets, and refuge, refuse removal. And then we went back again and looked at the time period and a year later, and only 58 people could put in 58 respond yes to those questions. So Asikigelane is a campaign that seeks to amplify community voices. So it's a community-based initiative where citizens actually monitor the services that they receive from the municipal. So, I mean, if you're seeing a 10% decline in services, especially in, in job revenue, that's a big problem because then it means that people don't have the services that they must have. It means that you will find rubbish lying around and that's a ticking time bomb in terms of um, health. And then the second part, the second um, impact of a stable coalition is on municipal budgets being compromised. So part of our work is to actually capacitate communities to look and see what has been budgeted for. So, so that when they engage, they engage from a point of not. And we find that um, by law, the mayor has political oversight over the financial affairs of the municipality. So now, if there is change of political structure, it means each mayor comes with their own priorities that must be done. And in our work, we encourage citizens to make an input into the IDP, make it to the municipal budget. So now, if there are mayoral priorities that need to be funded, it means with every change of the political structure, the budget also changes. And the municipality is not going to come back to us to say, okay, we are asking to shift the budget here. So then that defeats the whole purpose of public participation, which I'm going to speak about in the next slide. Uh, but the point is, we, um, I think we have cited that we should have something in this regard. And then the next part that I'll talk about is how a civil coalition are affecting public participation. A local government is for it to include the political structure, for it to include um, the administration and the community where it operates. But if you are finding one part of it bickering, then you are disregarding the other partnership and that's unconstitutional. Um, we are finding that political parties are putting their interests first over those that they are limited to, which is big problem. And also, the feeling on the ground is that councillors are holding committees at once. If if I elect you to represent me and then you get there and you have you push your own interest, then that will cause protest and necessarily be so. Um, as I mentioned that um and civil coalition disregard the involvement of community um, as prescribed by section 1521E of the constitution as well as the Citizens Act, which has all the last part of my contribution on the impact of the stable coalition is there's simply no one to account when there's a stable coalition. In our work, um, we encourage communities to engage in society. We encourage them to, to, to knock at the right doors. So if there's a problem with water, we facilitate that communication to the water and sanitation department. And if there's change of administration, like for instance now, in the city of Johannesburg, we've had three mayors this year. No one wants to take accountability. It's very difficult to engage. Even if we do um, research, I mean, reports and briefs, 
you simply do not have somebody who will take accountability for that. Actually, they want to engage with uh, Because, like, for instance, if there's change of council, it means a new mayor and a new MMC would have to make an impact in their portfolios. So, if you have a like, MMC for um, development and planning, you engage them today. They don't have enough time to implement what you're asking them to because they don't, they don't know if they will be a lot of no confidence that they get changed in the next three months or so. And I also looked at the motions of no confidence since the local government elections in 2021. And I couldn't find any substance in the, the motions of, of no confidence. It's, it's not about, you know, they're, they're not saying that you are providing accountable or democratic local government. It's not the substance, the key, the objects of local government that they're fighting. Which is, I mean, so what's the purpose? What is the crisis about? So, I mean, as civil society, what we're saying is people need to realize their power. We you know what happened when people boycotted the Utah. What happened when people disregarded the glow in the dark flame? We know what happens when uh, the labor force retracts their service from mining companies. So I just like to leave this. Thank you. Um, insightful, I think very important that you, that you made that input. Uh, Chelsea is a student with us in the master's program, so as you can see, we have the best students. Uh, so I think a really important input. Thank you all for, for sharing and introducing me. Thanks everyone for, for, for joining. Um, and I think it's really important that Chelsea made that input uh, to really highlight the impact of unstable coalitions. Mm -hmm. But also asking the question, what are those where we don't see the chaos? What are they doing in front? We don't actually spend enough time researching that. And I think there's a bit of a, a gap in the research at the moment. Uh, but I think there's so much happening in the bad waters that we sort of focus on that. Uh, and it's very serious, as you pointed out. Uh, and I'm glad you did that because it also gives me maybe the opportunity to add a bit of a, a lighter note to it. When I spoke to a official about three weeks ago, I think to the speaker a while ago, and I spoke to this official about it, and I told him, yes, I, I sent it to the speaker. His response was very telling, you know, from a dysfunctional coalition municipality saying, to which speaker did you send it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's hilarious, but it's also very problematic. We, and we see this actually quite often. It's, it's, um, uh, it's ridiculous, but it happens. We have two mayors, two speakers, sometimes even two municipal managers, each appointed in separate allegedly illegal or illegal meetings and people get appointed and money gets spent and in the end reports must come in to sort out who is actually the legitimate mayor, the legitimate speaker, and God forbid the legitimate municipal manager. All these things happen. So so it's it's a real problem. It's uh, sometimes uh, funny but but obviously the, the consequences are dire. In terms of where we are now, uh, in terms of the coalition debate, uh, I, I'm actually quite encouraged. Uh, I, I started thinking, writing, making noise about this about six, seven years ago. And, and at that point, the response was very muted and very well, a big issue. Uh, what were you concerned about? Um, and there was also a lot of arguments, quite sort of I would almost say a little bit ignorant, saying, well, coalitions are a bad thing and we must just abolish it. But that's not how it works. The reality is it's baked into our electoral system. And that electoral system is dictated by the Constitution. So if you want to abolish the possibility of coalition, you need to go all the way back to the Constitution and, and start it, and start there, which is fine. Why can you do that? But then you're opening up a whole can of worms uh, that says, you know, that we may not be ready to, to face up to. So it's a reality. Whether we like it or we don't like it, it's baked into our electoral system. And I think that's also what Chelsea 
uh, that I like it. And, and I think it's a good idea now. There's an overall awareness that this is going to be with us for some time to come, whether we like it or not. There are also interesting developments. There was the coalition's uh, dialogue uh, in, in August here on, on campus that we were part of, which I think is very encouraging. Of course, it was a big, uh, let's say, a big jamboree uh, with a lot of uh, people attending and a large meeting. So, you know, the real technical substance we perhaps not to discuss, but I think it was a real encouraging sign that we had that national dialogue on this you know, of coalitions and, and not you know see it as something foreign or something weird or something that ought to be abolished. Um there are of course moves of course to, to produce a framework and I know that the part of the problem of governance we presented here today by Wayne Commons and we're very happy that he's here is also you know busy working on, on ideas to, to regulate coalitions or to come into the legislative terrain with some amendments. There's a trade framework that's being prepared by the presidency. Um, so I think those are positive signs of engaging with the topic in a, in a constructive way. Uh, I'm also personally encouraged by the, I think I just get the name right, the, uh, the, the multi party or multi party pact. Uh, regardless of the politics of who's in, who's out, I'm, I'm not, I have no opinion on that. But I think the idea that we had a public, transparent, predictable, Pre election coalition uh, arrangements uh, uh, mediated by uh, an independent uh, professor, Professor Pumerin. I think we have a level of, of you know, maturity getting used to the idea that we can actually do this. Differently. It doesn't have to be a surprise, you look for the results, and then we all hide in dark rooms and you know, use something that nobody has access to, smoke filled rooms, and then just position and it may last a week or it may not last and we see now a little bit more predictability and professionalism in the coalition uh debate which i think which i think is um so what is what is required these are three points that i've made a number of times so apologies to those who've heard me made the point before is that we need to develop certain conventions soft law uh, on how to deal with coalitions. We cannot just rely on uh, uh, legal reform um, to be. Laura, uh, you look concerned. Is this on me? Are you negotiating with Are you So the um, the conventions are the kind of traditions, ways of doing things, customs that everybody agrees to, that are not written in law, that are flexible enough to develop as 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 situations arise, but that really start shaping the way we conduct coalition politics. We also need changes to our political culture. I don't want to talk too much about this because we need to focus this debate on, on the legal reform issues. Secondly, we need to protect our administrations from the coalition so much. And let's take one and we'll talk more about that because I do think we perhaps spend a bit too much time focusing on how do we limit the politicians, rein them in. Uh, but actually, maybe we should worry a bit less about that. Let, let the politicians do what they do. But while they do what they do, let's make sure that the rules of governance are in the So that just makes them into a big one. And thirdly, I think some limited scope for law reform, which is what I want to focus on. Uh, I do think that when when we look at our law, how it regulates local government in particular, uh, there are certain blind spots that we didn't think of when we were drafting these laws, and I, I was involved giving inputs uh, and, and shaping some of the legislation at the time. And I can assure you, coalitions were not on our minds. In the late 90s and early 2000s, it was not an issue. Uh, we really thought it was going to be either that party or this party. It was never going to be a combination of parties. It was simply not 
not on the on the minds of those who were drawn into the rules. Remember the slogan was until kingdom comes, you know, uh, and it was a slogan, and then kingdom came and suddenly we were all surprised. So so it's okay. You go back to the Lord, okay, maybe there was certain things that we missed and that we should have done differently. Um, so that's what I want to focus on. So before uh, you know the, the argument is gonna come. Uh, in order to be like, are oh, you just focusing on the law and it really is about politics? I completely agree. And I think Hans also made the point very important. We cannot fix the coalition chaos with law. Just make that absolutely clear. Uh, so there's lots of other things that need to be done and need to be developed and need to be improved upon. But there are a few legal things that we can focus on. And those that I want to, are the ones that I want to uh, raise. So can law reform help to reduce? The likelihood of coalition turmoil. I think there are some things that we can consider. Uh, Chelsea already mentioned the motions of no confidence. At the moment, there are no limits at all in any law, in any rules of order, on how many motions of no confidence can be tabled, can be discussed, can be passed, etc. So they fly, they fly around uh, like, I don't know, uh, 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 like, like across the council. Um, and you know that, that is maybe how democracy ought to work because emotion of confidence is an expression of our parliamentary democracy. Um, but you know, does it have to be an absolute free fall? Because of the also as Chelsea mentioned, it's very difficult to detect any substance to emotions of no confidence. Uh, very difficult to detect any substantive disagreement. You disagree with your policy, or you have taken a decision that is um, something we really disagree with. You have a severe sort of, yeah, policy disagreement, so we no longer have confidence in you as a man. No, it's never about it. We never take any of those arguments. It's just, you know, the numbers add up and it's our turn. That's really what it is about. Um, so, can we look at limiting motions of confidence without? Uh, constraining democracy. There's different ways of doing it. One could, for example, consider limiting the tabling of motions of confidence to certain time periods in the municipal term, or even in the calendar year or in the financial year of the municipality. You limit it to certain time periods. And there will be pros and cons to those options. Very interesting suggestion that we picked up, particularly <laughs> looking at, at, at Germany, but I think. Um, correct and, and common will, will, will come in on, on this one is you know the, the constructive motion from confidence idea that when you table a motion of confidence in the speaker, you must also have already an alternative candidate lined up and you must have the votes for that alternative candidate. So you can't just break what's in front of you and then lean back and wait for the next council meeting for a the chips to fall in a particular way. No, you must actually uh, produce an alternative in your motion of no confidence so that with the uh, removal of the incumbent, which could be the mayor, the speaker, chief whip, you already bring in the alternative with the required votes. I think that's a beautiful way of leaving democracy intact. We're not uh, limiting the democratic functioning, but you're forcing political parties to be constructed about their motions of no confidence. Or you could limit the number of motions of no confidence. Perhaps only one per council of return. Uh, or something that I, I, it's not going to be a silver bullet, it may not solve much, but it will at least address this issue of um, motions of no confidence just flying around the council like uh, like paper plates. So I think there's a number of ways in which we can look at limiting motions of no confidence. And I hear a lot of people being very um, worried about we're going to limit democracy and we're going to constrain politicians too much. I don't think that has to be that way. Secondly, transparency in the election of office bearers. Currently, we elect our office bearers in a secret ballot. The mayor, the speaker, uh, executive mayor, they are elected in a secret ballot. Um, I'm not quite sure what the grand reasoning was behind that. Uh, there was probably very good reasons to introduce it like that. I don't think it's a good idea to force a secret that. I think there should be much more flexibility. I can imagine that there could be reasons why the speaker of the council would decide to have a secret ballot if there are threats 
for example, flying around because real issues of people being threatened, being unsafe, they can't cast their, 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 their vote in a, in a safe way. Then maybe that would be a reason for the speaker to vote for a secret ballot, but it shouldn't be the law. I don't understand why it must be the law. We elect the public representatives in the previous day election, they are in the council. As a public, we want to know what what they stand for. What 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 do you vote for when you're in council? Why must that be hidden from us and the public? Because the result of it is the secret ballot becomes a, um, a, a safe haven for all kinds of shenanigans and deals and vote buying. Uh, and I think we need to we need to address it. Again, not by being drastic and by being forceful, but by inserting some flexibility into the system. Thirdly, I think an important point that I think many people have already raised and agree with is forcing the publication of coalition agreements. That we somehow force political parties that enter into a formal coalition arrangement uh, that they publicize the coalition agreement. Um, there's various permutations to that, but I think it's something that we need to seriously consider. Lastly, more time for negotiations after the elections, also something that's been talked often. At the moment, it's 14 days after the general election, after which the first council meeting must take place. In a coalition scenario, that's way too short. Um, just had the elections, you're done campaigning, maybe you are victorious, you're still mopping up the confetti, but in 12, 13 days, you must be ready with the coalition agreement. Now that's for sure. So what, what then happens is in that period that's way too short, uh, the time runs out, a meeting must be held, so the meeting is held, mm -hmm. someone is elected at that meeting, just depending on how the chips fall that day, and oops, they have a mayor, uh, a mayor without a coalition agreement, a mayor without, you know, a, a mandate, so you get the tail wagging the dog, it's exactly what happened in Joburg, and there was a meeting after two weeks because there were no no choice but to have a meeting, but there was no coalition agreement. A mayor was elected who then scurried afterwards to put together a coalition. So that's up is down and down is up. That won't work. So we need to give more time for coalition uh, arrangements to be made. Not too long, of course. You cannot afford a situation where a municipality is for a month or two months without leadership. And we also need to think very carefully. This is where uh, Mr. Bigwater's input comes in. What happens in that vacuum? How do we make sure that when we have two, three, four, six weeks, uh, how, how do things turn over um, in during those six weeks? Then the issue of threshold, a very thorny issue. And when it was raised very carefully at the coalition's dialogue, everyone jumped on top of it, and particularly the smaller political parties were, of course, uh, really angry about that proposal even on the table. The bigger political parties were a little bit more in favor of it. You know, it's a natural order of things, of course, because smaller political parties are very worried about their own existence. Um, so I don't want to go into you know all the pros and cons. I think it's very clear what the pros and cons are. Uh, diversity of voices, plurality, and diversity in the council and in the legislatives is something that you really hold dear. It was deliberately um, not put in to the system in 1994, any, any form of, of special threshold. Um, and one may want to hold on to that because it's a real value of South African politics that all voices count. And then also that all voices have an opportunity to enter the, 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 the legislature and the executive. On the downside of it is, of course, the arguments that, certainly in the context of how councils or coalition scenario, that uh, a large number of, of smaller political parties of the council <laughs> makes it harder to form a coalition compared to a scenario where you have a fewer, uh, a smaller number of political parties. There is some whole argument, that is, I think, more than true. That's not make it necessarily I mean, uh, uh, very easy. It's still hard to find agreement, but finding agreement between two or three political parties as opposed to six or seven, of course, is, is a different story. 
So I think we do need to enter that. At the moment, we don't have any special threshold in the council or the provincial or national extent. Of course, it doesn't mean some people argue you know, that, uh, that you cannot say that because that would mean that every party that participates gets a seat. That's not how it works. You still need to meet the, the, the threshold for, uh, for one seat, you know, that's mm -hmm. ter determined on the basis of the electoral outcome. So, of course, you need to have a certain minimum to get one seat. But we don't have a special threshold like 3% or 5% or 1%. Do we need to introduce that? I think that's a debate that we need to have. The point that I wanted to make for this particular meeting is that we really need to make a distinction between local governments and national and provincial governments. I'm already made reference to it. When we talk about a threshold for a seat in legislature, seat in the council, I'll talk later about the threshold for taking part in the executive. So a threshold for, for a seat in the council or the legislature is a threshold in the in the general election. So that you know, as a political party, you need to have obtained a certain minimum percentage of the general vote in order to be entitled to a seat on the legislature. Now, if we compare local government with national provincial government, there's a critical difference both of the legislature. The constitution says that the National Assembly and provincial legislatures, what they do is they, they pass laws and they exercise oversight of the executive. They are a truly a legislature. They only pass laws and exercise oversight of the executive. They don't exercise any administrative or executive functions, but those functions are exercised by the premier at the provincial level and the president with the regional government at national level. So the, the legislature has a limited role focused on the passing laws and exercising laws. Look at local governments, what's the role of municipal council? The municipal council is both the legislature and the executive. So the council takes executive decisions and it takes administrative decisions. It appoints staff, senior managers, it releases land for development. It approves policies, debt collection, tariff policies, uh, indigenous policies. Um, it approves all kinds of systems, performance management systems, uh, and all kinds of administrative decisions that municipal council must take. If that municipal council has a legislative or executive responsibility, if it malfunctions, it's disastrous for the municipality because the municipality cannot move. It's dependent on the council taking those decisions. Um, one municipal manager put it to me like this: like when my council does not function, the next day the trucks don't meet the deadline. That how it works. That how unforgiving the environment is. Mm -hmm. Now that is not the case at national provincial. Mm -hmm. If our national assembly is in disarray, which it sometimes is, we've seen it all during the state of the nation addresses, it's terrible. It gives a a, a terrible image of democracy and it has all kinds of dire consequences. But it doesn't have the consequence that the next day government drives to halt. No, because all the parties continue functioning, there are leaders in charge, there are executives, there are HODs, there are meetings, there are all things they do with that. So that's my argument for saying let's separate local government from national provincial government. We talk about the because I think that there is a greater case for legislative professional local government than there is for national government. So that's that's a point that I wanted to make on the legislative There are lots of other arguments that we need to have still, is it one percent, is it three percent? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, but let's maybe just pause at, at this argument for now. Then, my last point that I want to make is to look at the threshold for taking part in the executive. So, that's a different kind of threshold. So, just disregarding how easy or difficult we make it to get into the council, do we need to have certain rules for how easy or difficult is it to get into the executive, to be elected on the executive? Uh, as you all know, the council is elected and then it elects either an executive mayor, who is the one mayor, one person who holds executive power, who then appoints a mayoral committee, 
from the councillors on the council, it hand picks them and usually goes with the mayor or committee members, will be members of the coalition or members of the party that control the council. So it's a straightforward, uh, single executive, uh, strong mayor position, which I think consolidates coalition building because if you have a coalition agreement, with that agreement, you can put the mayor in office and the mayor can then implement that coalition agreement by rewarding the coalition partners with seats on the mayor of the committee. And the executive mayor does not feel constrained by any law directing him to appoint the person to appoint. So the expression on the part of the executive mayor to cement the coalition vision by appointing partners onto the mayor of the committee. That's the, the other system, so there is no threshold, which is in a sense a good coalition goal. There's no threshold between all the council and the LFA to be selected by the executive mayor, third on the mayor. The other system that we have, which applies in about 50% of, of our councils, is the executive committee system, which is a more inclusive executive. So there, the council essentially elects a committee, a committee that comprises of members of the council that are then elevated to becoming members of the executive committee. Uh, one of the members is elected as, as a mayor, and that forms a collective executive leadership of the municipality. Now, the important thing there is that the law prescribes that the composition of the executive committee must mirror the composition of the council. In other words, if you have 30% representation of the council, you shall have 30% representation of the executive committee. If you have 20% representation of the council, you shall have 20% representation of the executive committee. So it's an inclusive committee that proportionally represents the composition of the council. Is that good or bad for coalitions? Some people have argued, well, if we adopt that model throughout local government, we would forever have gotten rid of the whole coalition problem because your law already prescribes coalition composition. I think that's a very naive argument. Mm -hmm. And I think what we see in President Natal, where we have executive committee systems throughout the province, um, already shows that even in an executive committee system, you can still have coalition chaos. So it's not a sort of good. Um, one element of the system that makes it very flexible as well is that a, a political party that has representation on the executive committee can donate seats to another party. So they've deliberately included that into the law to make sure that if you have seats on the executive committee, you can, you can donate seats to another party. The ANC used that in its queen. So a, a seat was donated to a smaller party. The smaller party who would otherwise not be entitled to representation on the executive committee was still brought in because it was donated a seat by one of the bigger parties. So you can see that the law has been made quite flexible to make sure that coalition arrangements can still be made. Um, so there's a number of reasons why I think this type of, 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 of executive threshold is it's important to investigate a little bit more closely to see does it solve our problems with coalitions. I don't think it's a silver bullet because you still need a coalition agreement. It would be naive to argue that the simple act or occurrence of having an executive committee that represents the whole council proportionally would mean that there's now a coalition agreement in place. You still need to sit down and think about policy issues. What is your what is your policy agreement on? Uh, how do you negotiate the way forward for the municipality? The, the need for that doesn't fall away with the simple election of the executive committee. Secondly, what it does do, and I think this points a little bit more towards uh, the executive committee maybe being helpful for stability, is that it reduces the scope for negotiations because the, 
the, the coalition parties cannot negotiate about how many seats they each going to get on the executive because that's already determined by law. So what they can negotiate about is who's going to get the mayor, who's going to get the speaker, um, chairpersons of committees, um, and that's about it in terms of positions. Of course, deputy speaker, deputy mayor, if you have those positions. So it limits the scope for negotiation. Not everything is up for grabs because certain things are already predetermined by law, in particular, how politically the seats are distributed on the executive. What makes it a bit more difficult again to, to run a coalition government in an executive committee system is the fact that you have the opposition on your executive because they are they are brought in by the law. If you are a 20% or a 30% opposition party to the coalition, you have a seat on the executive. You are there, uh, which is great for inclusivity and transparency. There's all, all kinds of great things about that. But it also makes it harder for a coalition to use that executive committee meeting as a coalition meeting because, yeah, your opponents are in the room. They hear everything you say, they get all the documentation. So I'm not too sure what, what how, how helpful that is in terms of looking at it from a coalition perspective. I do agree, I do find that the executive committee system is a more progressive, transparent system for local government, but it doesn't necessarily make coalitions easier. Last point is even in a executive committee system, even though the seats on the executive committee are divided by law in terms of political parties, the mayor is still a majority decision. So that's an ordinary majority vote. Who becomes the mayor is determined by that majority vote. So they're all back So It really is again up to the coalition negotiations how they pan out in terms of who becomes the mayor. And I think our coalition politics is, is fairly crude and that issue is very important. Who becomes the mayor is that drives the minds of all the coalition negotiators. So in an executive committee system, we haven't solved that yet by any, any legal instrument because the mayor is a simple majority decision. So the argument I'm making in the paper is that we have an executive threshold in place in our legal system in the form of the executive committee system. Currently it applies to about half of our municipalities. It's interesting to look at. It's, we need to uh, develop some more uh, questions and, and, and research on how the executive committee, executive committee works in a coalition scenario. It's not a silver bullet for coalitions. But it's something that we can uh, that we can certainly look at. Um, the decision making on whether or not your municipality will be an executive committee or an executive mayor is ultimately made by the province. So the provincial government decides which of the two systems apply. In Nelson Mandela Bay, they're trying to impose midterm an executive committee system onto the municipality because there was coalition turmoil. I don't know where that's ended up. There was lots of resistance from within the council. And I think it's also practically very, very difficult to do it in the middle of the term because it's very, very disruptive for the municipality. Uh, but perhaps it's something that could be considered at the beginning of the term when there's a total outcome. For those municipalities that have, you know, the scrambled egg outcome that for those municipalities, the province could at the beginning of the term uh, introduce the executive committee model. Um, so as you can see, there are things that can be done in the law. None of them will be solutions. None of them will solve our problems, uh, but they will, I think, edge the issue in, in, in the right direction, I, I hope. Uh, and I think there are many other suggestions that we can look at, and I'm very keen to listen to Carmen later on, on you know, what are some of the things that, that were developed in Spain in, in a similar concern. Uh, and maybe we can we can draw some inspiration from that. But uh, let me stop it here. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here sharing this. Uh, so many insights and, and interesting ideas and, and debating them. Uh, my role here is to present the case of Spain. Spain that uh, 
country in the corner of the in that corner of the world known by our soccer teams, maybe. <laughs> our, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, our democratic transition as well, our Mediterranean way of life, and from a political perspective, uh, known by the stability, the strong stability of uh, our system of local government. So let me uh, give a brief uh, presentation on why uh, or what was the reason that the founding fathers of our constitution decided that uh, that stability had to be reinforced for local governments and how they did it. What are the main, the key pieces in the formal and informal institutions to, to, to achieve that. And uh, the first thing that uh, we need to know is that Spain, for the, before our democratic transition in the late 1970s, uh, had been gone through a, year, a, a century and a half of terrible um, uh, political instability. We had had six different, for, for that century and a half, we had passed through six different constitutions, uh, seven successful military coup d'etat, four royal abdications, two dictatorships, and four civil wars. That had been the previous history of Spain before our democratic transition in the late 1970s. And especially the instability of the political institutions of the democratic period before the authorita, before the civil war in the 1930s, that stream political, that stream political uh, instability made the founding fathers, the designers of the constitution, uh, to be very aware of stability and to try to uh, make the uh, constitution are the main laws, in this case, the laws regulating the, the local government to make all the efforts to produce stable uh, institutions. And the fact is that we have had 45 years of extremely stable local institutions, in part because most of our uh, uh, local governments are local governments based in absolute majorities in the council. And for that, that is completely stable. You have more than 50% of the councillors in the council belonging to the political parties. By the way, political national wide, uh, statewide political parties dominate the local arena, local, polit uh, local politics. So normally, uh, in three out of four, three in four municipalities are governed by a single party with an absolute majority, and that is completely stable. But in the rest of uh, uh, municipalities governed by coalitions, coalitions are also stable, and we are going to see in a minute why is that. So uh, um, you could think, OK, but don't you have uh, perhaps, don't you have motions of no confidence, motions of censure, uh, as we call them? Yes, the, the system provides for motions of uh, censure, but the fact is that they are having uh, exercise, exerted initiative for some reasons as well that I will present uh, later on. So what we have is, if you think of the possible or the different types of governments that we can have at the local level, we could have the one on the uh, left side, which is governments ruled by a single party, completely stable, and the three other cases, either in coalition or with a majority of, or with a mi minority or a single party with a minority, they are also stable. This is the figures of uh, the term, the last term, uh, the governments uh, elected, uh, the councils and governments elected after uh, the uh, uh, elections in 2019, and the governments, you see that uh, so more, uh, almost three quarters of governments are backed, are supported by uh, an, an absolute majority. Okay, and this is the last uh, uh, term. We had local elections last uh, May of uh, last uh, May, so now we have a different, uh, uh, a different uh, uh, percentages, but they vary very slightly. And this 
percentage of coalition is uh, is higher than what we had in the pandemic because in recent qualities in Spain, which we have seen the emergence of new political parties. So for the last eight years, we have had a, a new far right party, a new far left party, and uh, that has produced uh, that has produced the, the to have more chances of coalition government. Also, coalition governments are more common in those regions in Spain that have their own regional parties. You know that in Spain we have strong uh, regional diversity, that we have some regions even with governed by pro independence uh, parties, such as Catalonia or France country. Galicia also has uh, its own uh, national regional parties. So when you see the political party system in some regions in which there are more than the main nationwide parties, then there are more chances to have coalition government. So but this is the picture or, or these are these are the this is the figure and you have to think that this uh, percentage of coalition has increased over the years because of the emergence of new parties. So why what is the what, what did the the founding fathers of our constitution made how did they arrange this this how did they how they thought that they could uh, produce such a strong stability well they thought on the electoral system so some arrangements in the electoral systems and in the electoral system to elect local councils and uh, and they also thought in the form of government in the form of government meaning whether the power at the local level how is it how power is divided between the three pieces of local governance the council the administration and the mayor and uh, th those would be like the formal institutions the formal arrangements but there is also a third a key issue which produces a stability which is the, uh, the which is a, a, a belongs to the political culture, which is the strong part of the discipline that political parties have in our country. So it's uh, those, these would be the three in, in my vision, and I think that if there's no big debate about, about this, but in, from my perspective, these would be the three elements um, uh, contributing to stability, both in, of, contributing to stability also in coalition governments. So the electoral uh, the electoral system, we do have a principle for local elections, and that is 5%. So it's a relatively high threshold. So to get a, a, a council, to get representation in the council, a political party, uh, because our elections are based on party list mainly, a political party needs to get 5% of the valid votes. And this threshold is higher than what we have in uh, national elections. Interestingly, for the local uh, electoral system, all the elements were copied from the national and the regional electoral systems. So a proportional system with uh, don't rule of, for allocation of seats except for this one. The threshold is higher in the local elections for local elections compared to national or regional elections. And it is also has a historical um, explanation because uh, they, they wanted to especially avoid instability in, 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 council, in local councils. So uh, that means that for instance, in most of the municipalities in Spain, I want to give, I haven't given you this figure, but we have 80,130 municipalities in Spain. So, yeah, we do have, uh, we have 8,000 municipalities and council size is, uh, varies depending on the, the population in the municipality size in terms of population, okay? So we have from in the very small municipalities, three councillors in the council, and in the, 
biggest, largest municipality, which is Madrid, we have 57 uh, councillors. So what we would have in medium-sized municipalities is like three, sometimes just two deputies in the council, because only the conservatives and the social democrats get representation, only them overcome this threshold of 5% of the valid votes. Uh, but in smaller, in, sorry, in larger uh, uh, municipalities with uh, uh, larger council size, like in Madrid, in Madrid with 57 um, council, councillors of the council, we have only four political parties, four political parties represented in the council. But if you go to Barcelona, Barcelona, which has 41, is a smaller city and has 41 councillors in Barcelona, you will find six political parties represented in the council. So, okay, it is definitely rests plurality to the council, this idea or this uh, rule of having a, a, a threshold, an electoral threshold in 5%, but still you will find uh, uh, pol political parties represented, a good uh, number of political parties represented in the, in the councils when there is this uh, party political diversity. And then we have the, the other idea to produce stable governments is that is the rules to, to uh, elect the mayor. So citizens vote for the councillors, the councillors elect the mayor among them. So the first, in the first meeting, after elections, in the first meetings, the first thing that uh, councillors would do will be to vote for the mayor. And the one who gets an absolute majority will become the mayor. Not all of the councillors can be candidates for mayors, only the, those heading party lists. Okay, so only those heading party lists can be <laughs> candidates of, uh, for mayor, and the one who gets absolute majority of the votes becomes the mayor. The residual rule that I've written here means that if nobody gets an absolute majority, the head of the party list with more popular votes becomes the mayor. The one with more popular votes becomes the mayor, which, as you can imagine, is a great incentive to build coalitions. If there is not an absolute majority in the constellation of the council, then parties within the three weeks, because there are the electoral system sets that councillors have to will meet three weeks after elections. So in if three weeks after elections, uh, we have mayors, legitimate and effective mayors in the 8,131 municipalities in Spain because of this combination of the election of a mayor with the residual rule. Uh, and yeah. Um, when there is um, um, when there is not an absolute majority, then the the incentive for coalitions is 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 high. Otherwise, the the, the mayor with no with no majority will become uh, the candidate with no majority will become the mayor. The other element uh, um, granting stability to to local governments is the horizontal distribution of power. Remember that according to the different forms of government, uh, we have the uh, collective form of government, the council manager form of government, and the strong mayor or, uh, form of government. Spain is a case of strong mayor form of government, which means in this ideal type, the strong mayor form means that the mayor holds all the executive powers, has the majority of government and of, of the council, has the majority is back supported by a majority in the council and appoints the members of the executive. So with these, uh, all of these uh, powers granted by, uh, by this type of, of, of governmental, local governmental form, the uh, mayor, once he is elected, the mayor, how it has the power to run the uh, city hall and run the local government 
very effectively and very efficiently. It is difficult to remove to remove because of course, of course there are uh, um, quest, um, emotions of no confidence, but the emotion of no confidence has, uh, has very demanding requirements and it is so easy to present emotions of no confidence. First uh, uh, element is that they have to be constructive. So mo uh, with the opposition in coalition government, if the opposition wants to present a motion of no confidence, it has to present the candidate of, uh, for mayor. And once it is voted, if it is successful, then there will be a mayor immediately with the same executive functions, a strong, a strong mayor with executive functions. Okay, so. Uh, this uh, difficult, uh, this difficulty to present and be successful in the, in, the, in motions of no confidence is one of the electoral elements, uh, also and one of the elements that uh, is related to local governments. Also, there there is no um, building on what has been said before. There is uh, there is no limit to motions of confidence. Remember that I told you that only uh, around 180 average motions of confidence are presented and successful during a term, which is nothing if you think that we have 8,000 uh, municipalities. But uh, there are also some restrictions to the motion of confidence. Um, a councillor who has left his party to support a motion of confidence, that councillor cannot participate in a motion of confidence in the same term. So those councillors um, um, jumping from one party to the other to, to, to support a motion of confidence have their rights limited. First, they cannot participate in another motion of confidence, and then they cannot join the political group, the political party they went, uh, to they shift shifted to and uh, they have all the um, uh, economic uh, resources or uh, for belonging to that to, to a, a council group they they will not get them after they participate in the motion of confidence okay so that this is the reason why uh, uh, parties, uh, sorry, mayors are uh, difficult uh, to remove because of the regulation of the motion of confidence. And I want to say something here, something additional. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, if the, uh, for some reason, if the mayor loses, the mayor in a coalition of government uh, loses the, 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 um, the support of the council, but there is no a success, success, successful motion of confidence, the mayor can perfectly navigate in a minority government because of this strong, uh, this, uh, strong executive powers. They can launch public, procedure, public procure, procurement procedures. They can even approve a budget. The budget is the only, um, the only um, decision that has to be passed through the council, but there are also some possibilities to approve the budget without the majority of the council through a motion of confidence, especially set for these situations. In Barcelona, for instance, uh, the last term, the mayor of Barcelona approved uh, twice a budget without the majority of the council through this type of promotion of confidence. That's how it is called. And finally, uh, there is a political culture element which is a strong party discipline. So uh, first of all, as I, well, or as I said, um, the, the, for, uh, local politics is dominated by big political parties, but nationwide political parties and regional, like Catalan or uh, uh, regional uh, uh, political parties. 
and that those parties have strong sense of party discipline and they are present in all the territory. Um, independent candidates will be will are, are really um, um, a, a very small minority. So with these nationwide and regional wide parties dominating local politics with this strong party discipline uh, um, behavior and with these strong hierarchical structures, it is it is very difficult to that uh, we have that we could find, for instance, motions of no confidence based on one member of a nation or regional wide, wide political parties moving to another to another uh, party to make a motion of no confidence successful. This this party discipline in Spain gets to the point of, for instance, from the head of the political party, uh, they can tell to the tiniest municipal uh, party uh, how they have to deal with coalitions. So there is a national order from the central headquarters in the parties saying, okay, you don't, you, you the mayor in this or the, the, the municipal group in this small municipality, if you make coalitions, coalitions have to be with this party or but not with that party. So the, the, uh, the party discipline gets to that point that they follow councillors in smaller municipalities, they follow the orders of what the uh, head of the party, political party that they, in the national level sense. So they operate and under a very effective chain of command. And uh, this machinery, a very well-oiled machinery of three elements, the party discipline, the system of strong mayor able with all the executive powers able to navigate even in uh, weak uh, situations and the support of the majority of, of the council the mayor supported by the majority of the council is what has uh, produced the stability of these uh, local governments in spain for already 45 years thank you very much colleagues uh, thanks prof for inviting me Always nice coming back to the WC where I studied 18 years ago. My first time back in this building where we are now 19 years, so it's nice being back here. I didn't do a presentation because obviously I wasn't, uh, I didn't know who was going to say what. So I was asked to respond, so I'm going to talk based on what was discussed today. I think, I think <clears throat> from where we sit, and always respect, I say we have in this government, is that I think there's broad consensus that there's need for legal reform. The corruption is functioning in our country. But I think what, what Prof said in his presentation, and I want to get the words right, he said soft law. There's a need for soft law. And, and I was part of a discussion. I was part of a discussion a couple of weeks ago, and this issue around those things that one can't legislate uh, became very important, what was discussed. And it was discussed in the context of what I think Chelsea mentioned around, we've got about 50, 50 stable municipalities, collision municipalities, and the question was, what are they doing right? You know? And in this discussion, one or two of those mayors was asked to, to speak and to present to us what they are doing right. And I think what became very clear in those discussions was those things that goes beyond the law that must be there uh, uh, that contributes to our stability. And what they mentioned in, in the discussion uh, made notes there. Sorry for this, guys. That's what I must represent them. I think it goes to the soft law issues. It, they, they mentioned issues around respect and respect for each other. So whether you are the smallest party or whether you are the biggest party in the coalition, you must respect each other. The other issue that was mentioned was around honesty, being honest with each other uh, as, as the parties in the coalition. 
And so that's what you can't legislate. You can't put legislation, you know. It's about maturity, political maturity amongst the parties. I think there was another issue that came through around 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 honesty, respect, and trusting each other. The parties must trust each other. If there's no trust, then it in a way contributes towards instability that might happen in the coalition governments. And the last point that they also mentioned was the issue of treating the smallest party in the very same way as the majority party in the coalition. So these are the soft things I think that came through in the discussion. I think it goes back to a point Rob made around what we can put in legislation and those things that I think you can't put in legislation. You know, and I see then as I see that is the soft issues, you know. And and <clears throat> What we're advocating for is, is a short-term solution, a, a medium, medium term and a long term. Now, the short the short-term solution for stability in the coalition government level is in the framework that the Prof spoke about that was developed in 2021 by Sala. So there's already a framework developed, I think it was done in conjunction with the Law of Institute, where I think many of the soft issues are coming through. And the soft things are, 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 are being 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 uh, discussed. And what we are saying is, if councils with their coalition governments can adopt to that, that that framework, that framework can be used as an instrument or a tool uh, to govern the coalition government. Uh, whilst in the background, the legal reform at the national government level is being initiated through legislation. Um, and obviously, the long term solution is around. Legislation, and I think as we said, the national dialogue as a department, that process around legislation has begun, and and to a point where we are getting the voting blocks in place to initiate consultation very soon on that, and some of the key things that is in that particular uh, draft legislation. I think it has been discussed here today around thresholds. Now, now Spain says 5%. Um, I think what we are proposing currently is 1% threshold. But again, there's many views from many players in various corners. I think ultimately what's important for us is to come with a situation or a solution that addresses our context in our country. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure once we go and discuss, that there will be more suggestions around the thresholds, okay? Uh, similarly, the issue around the collision agreement uh, is part of the legislation. So in other words, the need for, a, for an agreement, it must be there, it must be made public. And what you will see in the suggestion is also some suggestion of proposals around the content of the, of the agreement. And the question I think one can ask oneself is, if you talk about citizenry accountability, in other words, how can the citizens uh, how the coalition accountable. Can this coalition government instrument be a tool that can be used by the citizens to hold the coalition accountable? And if so, how? Okay. Uh, similarly, the issue around, I think Prof mentioned it around uh, uh, this 14 days, and the law says within 14 days, uh, the coalition government must be formed. It's another point that we're looking at in legislation, and the suggestion is, to what what would be a reasonable period? You know, there's proposed around 90 days, 60 days, but even there, people are saying it's too long. Uh, I read I read last week people talking about one month. Uh, is that enough? So I think it's made that there's a lot of proposals on the table. What we are saying is is we must come to a period that that I think is a reasonable period to allow the government to perform. And I think that only period becomes important because the ships will not sink during that time. And and again, they're discussing what will be important, what model can we come with to ensure that service delivery is still happening during that period uh, uh, whilst the government has been informed. And I'm hoping that today, as we discuss here, there will be some suggestions coming through so that us as the lawmakers back home, we can see how we can, can further improve. Thanks, Prof.